Goods power that is needed to stand up in public on one of the last days where Heathrop has a public voice and talk about Ignatian spirituality when you don't carry the acronym SJ after your name. I do actually carry the acronym CJ after my name, which of course is a far, far better thing. Uh, <laughs> I once was actually put uh, on a public brochure as being Gemma Simmons SJ, which caused a certain amount of alarm, but not anything like the amount of alarm that was caused the time that I was in another public brochure as Gemma Simmons OP. But that's, <laughs> that, uh, that belongs to another moment in my, uh, in my life altogether. And what I'm not going to do is to provide a sort of elegy for Heathrop here. Uh, this is not the day for that, and anyway, uh, I've never believed in having a funeral when there isn't a corpse. <laughs> the show ain't over till the fat lady sings. Well, this particular fat lady hasn't even cleared her throat yet. <laughs> huh? And the fat lady of uh, what is called these days Ignatian spirituality has absolutely no intention of dying whatsoever. What I do want to do is to pay a very uh, necessary and well-deserved tribute to the many people who have contributed in the history of uh, Trito Heathrop and Deutero Heathrop, i.e. Heathro Heathrop in London, to the extraordinary flourishing of Ignatian spirituality in these aisles um, since the 1970s or so. I think one of the things that endears the whole enterprise of good ship Ignatian spirituality to me so much is the fact that from the very beginning it has been a fully collaborative enterprise. The Jesuits themselves are fond of saying, with a very uh, commendable meticulousness, that there is a significant difference between Jesuit spirituality and Ignatian spirituality. I just want to put that out there so that that's a given to which I don't really need consciously to refer again. But if we are talking about Ignatian spirituality, and I'm conscious that Philip uh, said uh, short, a short while ago that neither of those concepts would have been particularly familiar to Ignatius himself. And I think actually if he'd heard the word Ignatian spirituality, he'd have been puzzled and embarrassed in equal measure. <coughs> Nevertheless, they come into a whole trope with which we're very familiar. Uh, used very much these days by people in the spirituality industry. And it has, of course, become a massive industry with a great deal of uh, money, fame, and confusion attached to it. You have only to go down to Waterstones down the road and ask them for a book on Ignatian spirituality. They look at you in a puzzled way, and so you think, let's drop the I word, because that's too confusing. Let's just try, have you got any books on spirituality? And if you've got somebody particularly acute, they will eventually send you to the self-help section, <laughs> where you may find the uh, confessions of St. Augustine nestling next to tantric sex, the Karma Sutra, <laughs> colour me beautiful, and playing the Mongolian nose flute. <laughs> the very fact that all of these things are seen as branches of self-help are, of course, a radical denial of what Ignatius himself and his early companions were convinced of, namely that we cannot, in the context of spirit spirituality, help ourselves at all human beings have a default mechanism of self-implosion and self-destruction when they turn away from the root of their very existence, namely the creator God. <laughs>
The discourse around spirituality, therefore, comes under the label, I'm spiritual but not religious. And I want to give a very, very brief context of this with uh, acknowledgments and thanks to the great um, chief rabbi, Jonathan Sachs, who wrote uh, a very uh, remarkable piece on cultural climate change, in which he looked at the collapse of three master narratives in the West. One part of this master narrative, which goes along with the I'm spiritual but not religious, is that the world is getting progressively more secular. The second is that the world is becoming progressively more westernized. And the third is that to survive in contemporary society, any religion has to accommodate itself. Sachs's notion was that, and it's a lovely uh, Jewish sense of, on the one hand, on the other. So on the one hand, I think we can say with a fair bit of evidence that the world is becoming increasingly secular, at the same time as we can say the same world, but just not the same part of it, is becoming increasingly more religious. And if we hold those two things in tension, the one thing it seems to me that we desperately need is some way of being able to steer away through this, some way of being able to discern the spirits of the times. So the secularization thesis has been running for some centuries. The 17th century saw the secularization of knowledge under Newton and Descartes, both of whom, of course, were profoundly religious people, but who sought in their own different ways to base knowledge on non-doctrinal foundations. In the 18th century, we saw the secularization of power, political power, particularly through the two great revolutions in France and America. The 19th century and progressively into the 20th century saw the secularization of culture. And more than anything else, the 20th century, particularly in the aftermath of World War II, have seen the secularization of morality as it seeks to decouple itself from a traditional Judeo-Christian ethic. So if we are to buy into all of this, why on earth would Ignatian spirituality flourish at all, except as some sort of um, accessory, religious accessory, to an increasingly narcissistic population who have finished looking at everything else and have ended up looking at their own navels. Because, of course, in many parts of the world, principally in the Middle East, Africa and Asia, the world is not becoming more and more secular, it's actually becoming more and more religious. In some ways that are dangerous and toxic, and in some ways that are potentially enormously liberating. And the same thing in small pockets, it seems to me, is actually happening also in the Western world. We also have four uh, very ancient civilizations. This is something that Sachs points to, namely those of China, India, Russia, and the Islamic world that are becoming increasingly self-consciously religious. And the West is having to cope with that and having to learn a language to deal with it. At the same time, it seems to me also that the West is beginning at last to discover the true depth of the emptiness of a consumer culture and is asking itself again by on what premises can we find a way to live the common good and to live a good life. In all of these things, the 
Ignatian tradition of finding God in all things and of discerning the spirits of the times within a background of culture, within the background of the signs of the times, has never been more important. And Heathrop has done its bit over the, the decades, over the centuries, I was going to say, but particularly since the uh, latter half of the 20th century, both in the setting up, for instance, of and continuance of the Way Journal, which has made serious reflection on Ignatian spirituality available to all, and in the writings of many of the people who operated out of this college, and it's always, always invidious to talk about individuals, um, but I'm going to anyway. Um, <laughs> And I would want to mention particularly the names of Philip Endine, how good it is to have you here uh, with us, Philip, and David Lonsdale, and Philip Sheldrake, and Lavinia Byrne, and how wonderful it is to have Jackie Hawkins here, um, who did such an extraordinary job to keep the fire of uh, learning um, about Ignatian spirituality alive. How good it is to have had not only the extraordinary learning of um, Eddie Howells in the college during this period, uh, more recent period, but also to have the ecumenical dimension of Ignatian spirituality seriously embedded um, in all his own work, and also the embedding of Ignatian spirituality in the more general British um, and uh, medieval and ancient mystical traditions. All of those things have been strengths. They are strengths that have come, that have gone, that have changed, that have modified. In very, very much more recent years, we've seen the whole flourishing of the Jesuit media initiatives, another collaborative venture in which from the very beginning and very rightly, uh, lay people and people who are neither Jesuit nor indeed Catholic have contributed to the flourishing of a school of prayer and a school of spirituality through modern communications media. These have been good things, these have been strong things, but they are no substitute for actually doing it, for actually setting down to get to grips with this tradition and to make it somehow a part of one's life. I myself have also been very much involved in the last three years in the setting up of the community of St Anselm at Lambeth Palace, another leap, as it were, from one part of the Christian tradition to another. And it's fascinating to find someone who comes from the background of the present Archbishop of Canterbury, who is by no means an Anglo-Catholic and who doesn't come out of an academic tradition, but out of a tradition that is connected with business and structural thinking, deciding that the future of the Anglican Church itself depends on its absorbing parts of the mystical tradition and in particular, the discernment tradition that is connected with Ignatius Loyola. He would see this as a really essential and necessary part of the formation of people, not for priesthood and not directly for service of the church within its own structures, but service of the world. And here, therefore, we come. I think, if I remember rightly, that in a whimsical moment, I had named this talk um, Ignatian Spirituality Blowing in the Wind. I was talking about this at supper last night with one of my community who remarked that her mother, as a young woman, had misheard the lyrics of Bob Dylan's song and had understood it as something profoundly ecological, whose refrain went, the ants are my friends, they're blowing in the wind. And for a very long time had this notion of these airborne ants being very friendly towards her. <laughs> 
I think that tells us the danger of mishearing or misinterpreting or failing to see um, the message within a context and within the signs of the times. Because the signs of the times are not looking good. It's not only that the demise of Heathrop is part of very particular signs of the times, both in the general culture and the way we have of doing um, academic work and business in this country. But I think that the demise of Heathrop is part of signs of the times within the church. And I'm particularly thinking of the Roman Catholic Church here, but also of the wider churches who are trying to keep structures going that are no longer fit for purpose. Who are trying to keep structures going that are no longer fit for purpose and are basically unaffordable. And the same is true, I think, of a traditional way of running retreats and retreat houses. If there have been failures in terms of how Heathrop has done its outreach in terms of spirituality, I would want to put my own hand up as having failed to manage to make a real um, rapprochement and a real collaboration between the retreat houses where people go to pray and be silent and people also go to learn how to accompany other people in prayer and the academic side where we are reflecting profoundly and critically and theologically on the whole tradition of Ignatian mysticism, whether it belongs to Ignatius himself or those who followed him either within or outside the Society of Jesus. It was a particular irony to me that at one point it became obvious to us here at Heathrop that it was perhaps curious that we had MA courses in Franciscan spirituality, in Carmelite spirituality, in the spirituality of the English mystics, and yet we had no course at all in the Ignatian tradition. Well, that was remedied some time ago, and the Ignatian tradition encompassed something beyond the borders of the writings of Ignatius himself. But when we attempted to make a marriage between what was going on here and what was academically um, endorsed here and what was going on in other parts of the country where people were doing formation courses to learn to become spiritual directors, we were unable to marry the two. And that remains to me a sorrow that it was something we were never able to achieve. At the same time, mostly through the um, urging um, of Eddie Howells and other colleagues overseas, we did manage to have at least one very good symposium where, tell it not in Gath, um, we brought together people of different cultures and different languages doing Ignatian spirituality. Because what is available to us in this country, except through the remarkable auspices and continued work of the way, is very, very Anglophone. And one has only to pick up and read some of the things that are being written in French, in Spanish, in German, in Italian, that come out of Ignatian spirituality, to realise what we've all known in this country for a very long time, which is that foreigners do it differently. <laughs> so what is there left to be done what is there left to be done that we and Heathrop didn't manage entirely to do, although we tried to sow some seeds? It seems to me that one of the things that is left to be done is to marry somehow the worlds of formation, where people are learning to accompany others in prayer, and people are learning to help others to discern the signs of the times in the light of the mystical and spiritual tradition of the Judeo-Christian and, dare I say it, Islamic holy texts. I had a very interesting time some uh, a year or so ago in the Abrahamic religions degree course here. 
asking a group mostly of young Muslim women if they thought that the first week of the Ignatian exercises, which I had explained very carefully to them, could be given to a group of Muslims. They came to the conclusion that Christians think about sin in a funny way. <laughs> but apart from that, they thought, yes, they could. Now, there would be an interesting place to go. But somehow, this way of bringing together both the academic and critically analytical and reflective and the practical has not worked in the way that I would love to see it work and think it needs to work. At the same time, actually going on retreat, making retreats, has become a very expensive business. It's become largely the provenance of wealthy, middle-class people. And as such, it is not doing its job. I'm going to be a little bit controversial here. Why not? It's my last chance. <laughs> to say that for me, particularly as someone who's also worked here, in the training of people for ministry. The paucity of spiritual training of the people that we are putting forward for the priesthood is utterly, utterly shameful and tragic. Not because these are not people who pray themselves, they do they pray most sincerely. But training them both in how to pray reflectively on their own life experience through the examine, on the scriptures in imaginative prayer, teaching them how themselves to be teachers to others of prayer simply barely touches the surface with regard to the curriculum for training people for the priesthood. That is true within the Catholic tradition. That is also true in the other traditions within Christianity with which um, I'm also involved when it comes to the formation of people in, uh, in ministry. If those in ministry barely know how to pray effectively themselves, how can they teach anybody else? If they have very, very few tools with which to do discernment themselves, how can they teach anybody else? And at the same time, down the river at Lambeth Palace, the Archbishop of Canterbury is seeing the very survival of his churches as depending on having people who are being trained not for direct ministry, but for life in the world, decision makers, opinion makers, as people who are people of spirit, who come out of a spiritual context, who know how to discern spirits within the signs of the times, in the media, in the economic world, in the legal world, in the corporate world. Without such decisions, all we get is decisions which are without soul. And somehow, this needs to be done. This needs to be grasped. At the same time, and uh, I'm not going to go on a rant about this because I could be doing it for hours, the paucity of what is being offered to people of faith with regard to a spiritual tradition. Forgive me if this is somewhere where you yourself have an enormous devotion, but the kinds of devotions, the kind of devotional art that we see in our churches is the divine mercy with Jesus with pink beams coming out of his chest the only depiction we can offer people that actually speaks in a meaningful way about the mercy and love of God the lyrical paucity of so much of the music that comes out of the fundamentalist charismatic movements that are sweeping some parts of the Christian church now are almost mindless in their banality. Is that the best we can do? I think it's not. I think there is a whole depth of mystical tradition that you do not need to come and do an MA at Heathrop or anywhere else in order to be able to uh, catch what it says. And yet here we are a place that has held a tradition 
a place that has formed a tradition, a place that is now at the point of handing on a tradition. To whom do we hand it on? How do we hand it on? I haven't got the final answer to that, but I am absolutely sure of this. Number one, it must be collaborative. We cannot think of Ignatian spirituality in a special little closed bubble. It must be ecumenical. It must be embedded in culture. It must be embedded in the signs of the times. In many ways, I think, what happens when you're carrying a treasure in your hands? You've carried it and treasured it and nurtured and nourished it for many years. And it becomes clear that the place in which you've nourished it is no longer able to sustain it. I think the best thing to do is to stand on any one of the bridges in London above the Thames and throw it to the wind. In that respect, my dear friends, the answer is indeed blowing in the wind. Thank you.